These next set of videos are going to take a look at second order linear equations in increasing complexity. Ultimately, we're trying to solve the same type of problem. We're just going to add a layer of complexity to it each time. So the question we're trying to answer ultimately is how do we solve homogeneous second ordered linear differential equations. And so there's a lot of words in that question. So what do we mean exactly when we say homogeneous second ordered linear? And technically, we could throw the word ordinary in there, differential equations. First off, homogeneous with the second ordered and higher order differential equations is different than the homogeneous equations we saw when we were talking about first order differential equations. Homogeneous means something completely different here, and we'll use a completely different strategy. So be careful not to mix those up. It's probably easiest to define a homogeneous second ordered linear differential equation with an example of what the form looks like. It's going to be something of the form y double prime plus some function of x times y prime plus another function of x times y equal to 0. Now, it's second ordered because we have a second derivative. That's what makes it second ordered. What makes it linear? is that our functions are only of x. And there are no exponents or products of the function y and its components. We don't have y times y prime. We don't have y double prime to the fifth power. It's just y prime plus a function of x times y prime plus a function of x times y. That's what makes it a linear differential equation. The other part is the homogeneous part. The homogeneous means that it is equal to 0. So the second derivative is what makes it second ordered. The functions only of x and no exponents are products of y is what makes it linear. And the equal to 0 is what makes it homogeneous. So basically, we're solving problems of this form when we say homogeneous second order linear differential equations. When we solve these problems, what we'll find is we're actually looking for two particular solutions. And they must be linearly independent. So let's look at that concept before we get too far away from it. What does it mean to be linearly independent? If you took linear algebra, you'll recognize the phrase linearly independent. It means the exact same thing here. If two functions are linearly independent, what we're saying is 1 
is not a multiple of another. For example, 5 times the sine of x and 10 times the sine of x are dependent. And the reason they're dependent is we multiply the first one by 2. It's a linear multiple, one a linear multiple of the other. 5 sine x times 2 gives you the other one. Those are linearly dependent. Independent would be like sine x and cosine x. You can't multiply sine x by something to get cosine x. Those are linearly independent. Now, we need a better way than just saying, I can't find a multiple, so they must be independent. So the way we test for linear independence is we use what's called the Wronskian. The Wronskian is a test for independence of two functions, f and g. And how the Wronskian is calculated is it is the determinant of the function f and g in the first row and their first derivative in the next row. Now, if you've taken linear algebra, this looks very familiar to you. If you haven't taken linear algebra, let me give you a quick lesson on a 2 by 2 determinant. The way you find a determinant is you're going to multiply the first diagonal f times g prime, and you're going to subtract the backwards diagonal f prime times g. And if the Wronskian is equal to 0, it turns out that the two functions are dependent on each other. If the Wronskian is not equal to 0, then the two functions are independent. So using our example from up above, where we had 5 sine x and 10 sine x. We already know they're dependent because we can multiply by 2. This one's a little more obvious. But let's actually calculate the Wronskian for this. The Wronskian says we take the first function and the second function in the first row, their derivatives in the second row, 5 cosine x and 10 cosine x. The way we calculate a determinant is we multiply the diagonals. 5 times 10 is 50 sine x cosine x minus the second diagonal. 5 times 10 is 50 sine x cosine x. And 50 minus 50 gives us 0 sine x cosine x's. And so we can conclude then, therefore, these are dependent functions. Now, sometimes it's obvious like this one. Sometimes it's not so obvious if functions are independent or dependent. So let's try x plus 1 and x squared. If we want to calculate the Wronskian, The wrong skin is equal to the determinant of the first function and the second function. And their derivatives in the second row, the derivatives are 1 and 2x. Multiplying the diagonals, we get 2x times x plus 1 minus 1 times x squared. That's going to give us, when we distribute, 2x squared minus x squared is x squared plus 2x. 
And x squared plus 2x is not equal to 0 for almost all values of x. And so we can conclude then, because we did not get 0, that these two functions are independent. So that's what we mean by independent functions and how we can test independent functions. What we were interested in, though, with this point is finding two solutions to our differential equation that are linearly independent. And those two solutions then can be used to build the general solution. So let's talk a bit about that general solution. The general solution to a linear differential equation that's homogeneous and second ordered is going to be y equals the first constant times the first solution plus constant 2 times the second solution, where y1 and y2 are the two linearly independent solutions. Now, as an aside, back in our first chapter talking about first order differential equations, we could find the constant by using an initial condition. Since we have two constants now with a second order differential equation, and that's not a coincidence, we will need two initial conditions. for y at some point and y prime at some point to find our two constants, c1 and c2. OK, that's the theory behind what we're doing. What we're going to do is ultimately find two linearly independent solutions and plug those two independent solutions into the general solution. Now that we know in theory what we're doing, let's look at how we can solve a linear second order differential equation that's homogeneous that specifically has constant coefficients. In other words, that q of x and the p of x in the general form is just going to be a constant. So we could rewrite the equation as a times y prime prime plus b times y prime plus c y equals 0. If we have a linear second order differential equation that's homogeneous with constant coefficients, the process we will use is first, we will rewrite the expression as a times. And instead of the second derivative of y, we're going to have a derivative operator that we're going to call d. And d squared means the second derivative. That's the operator that takes the second derivative. Plus b times the first derivative is just d plus c, and we're going to ignore the y as we make this, because we're not actually taking a derivative of y, equal to 0. What's nice about this is it changes the differential equation into something that we can solve, usually by factoring, to figure out what d is equal to. And it's going to have two solutions, the first root and the second root, because we know a quadratic has two solutions. And if those solutions are real and distinct, then the solution is y equals c1 times e to the first root times x plus c2 e to the second root times x. 
let's take a look at an example where we can work through that process. Examples. First, we're going to solve 12y prime prime plus y prime minus 6y equals 0. And let's give it initial conditions that y of 0 is equal to 7 and y prime of 0 is equal to negative 1. Again, two initial conditions because it's second ordered. First step in our process, then, is we rewrite this with differential operators. We're going to call this 12d squared plus d minus 6 equals 0. The second step is we're going to factor 12 is going to be 3d times 4d. 6 is 2 times 3. And if we make it a minus 8 and a plus 9, that'll give us the 1d in the middle. So I can see then that d is equal to 2 thirds and negative 3 fourths. Our solution then, after factoring it, is going to be y equals the first constant times e to the first root times x plus the second constant times e to the next root times x. And so we end up with the general solution y equals c1 e to the 2 thirds x plus c2 e to the negative 3 fourths x. This time, we had some initial conditions, so I can plug them in. If I use the y equals 0 and plug that in, the answer should be 7. So we end up with 7 equals c1 times e to the 0, which is just c1 plus c2 times e to the 0, which is just c2. For comparison purposes, we're going to use our second point. It deals with y prime. So we need to know what y prime is. So we'll take the derivative of our y. We're taking the derivative, we get 2 thirds c1 e to the 2 thirds x minus negative 3 fourths c2 e to the negative 3 fourths x. Plugging in that second point, the answer is negative 1 equals 2 thirds c1 times e to the 0, which is 1, minus 3 fourths c2 times e to the 0, which is 1. So now we end up with the system of two equations and two unknowns. And we can solve this system lots of ways. This time, I'm going to solve it by first multiplying the first equation by 12 and distribute that through. So that first equation becomes negative 12 equals 8c1 minus 9c2. And then the first equation, I'll just go ahead and solve for c1 by subtracting c2 from both sides. So 7 minus c2 is equal to c1. And then I can plug that into c1. And this just becomes an exercise from Math 99. Negative 12 is equal to 8 times 7 minus c2 minus 9c2. Negative 12 equals 56 minus 8c2 minus 9c2. Negative 12 is 56 minus 17c2. Subtracting 56, we get negative 68 equals negative 17c2. And if we divide by negative 17, I think that comes out remarkably nice. Yeah, c2 is equal to 4. And so if I want to know what c1 equals, c1 is 7 minus c2. So c1 is equal to 3. And now I can go back to my original answer to get my final answer. 
careful. The original answer is the red one. So the final answer, the solution to 12, y prime prime plus y prime minus 6y equals 0, where y of 0 is 7 and y prime of 0 is negative 1, is y equals c1, which is 3, e to the 2 thirds x, plus c2, which is 4, e to the negative 3 fourths x. And this becomes my solution to the second ordered linear differential equation that's homogeneous with constant coefficients. Let's try a couple more examples that walk through that exact same process, but maybe look at some special cases that might come up along the way. Let's first solve y prime prime plus 3y prime equals 0. And we'll do this generally. We'll keep the constants in our final answer. So when we rewrite, we end up with d squared plus 3d equals 0. Factor out a d, and we get d plus 3 equals 0. And so d is equal to 0 and negative 3. So when I go to writing my general solution, we have y equals c1 e to the 0x plus c2 e to the negative 3x. But what's interesting is what happens to that e to the 0x? e to the 0x is just 1, so it's probably best to write this answer as y equals c1 plus c2 e to the negative 3x for our final general solution. So that's not too weird when we end up with 0 as a factor. But one more example that can come up doesn't look like a problem at first, but we'll talk about why it's a problem. We're going to do y prime prime minus 8y prime plus 16y equals 0, which gives me d squared minus 8d plus 16 equals 0 which factors to d minus 4 squared equals 0, or d minus 4 times d minus 4. There is really only one solution for d. Technically, it's a double root. So that might make us think, gee, is it going to be y equals c1 e to the 4x plus c2 e to the 4x? The problem with this is our two solutions, e to the 4x and e to the 4x, are not linearly independent. You could find the Ronskian and check it for sure, but the easy way is just to look at it. And if you multiply the first one times 1, you get the second one. We need two linearly independent solutions. And so if e to the 4x is one solution. Our second solution needs to be linearly independent. It can't just be e to the 4x. Well, let's see what happens when we multiply by an x. Would that make it linearly independent? Let's test it. e to the 4x and x e to the 4x are our two functions. The derivative of the first is 4e to the 4x. The second one is a product, so we'll use the product rule. The derivative of x is 1, and so we have e to the 4x plus. The derivative of e to the 4x is 4e to the 4x, and we still have an x on there. Calculating that determinant, we end up with e to the 4x times e to the 4x plus 4x e to the 4x minus 4 times x times e to the 4 plus 4 is 8x when we combine the exponents by adding. Let's see if that's going to give us 0. We've got e to the 8x plus 4x e to the 8x minus 4x e to the 8x. And when we subtract, we end up with e to the 8x, which is not equal to 0, which means they are linearly independent. 
So the way we're going to fix the double root is we'll multiply one of the solutions by x, which means our general solution here is going to be y equals c1 times the first solution, e to the 4x, plus c2 times the second solution, which is x e to the 4x, to ensure that they are two linearly independent solutions. I'll leave it to you to check that and take its first and second derivatives and plug in to verify, does this still actually work as a solution to the differential equation? And you'll find that, yes, it does. It does give you 0 for the final solution. So today we're solving homogeneous second-ordered linear differential equations with constant coefficients. That's a mouthful. But all of those requirements must be satisfied in order to use this method. In our next video, we'll extend it and start looking at a more and more general version of solving these problems. But for now, it's your turn to practice. We'll see you in class with any questions.